If you want to get up and running quickly using Google's Data Studio to analyze and visualize your data, then give me 15 minutes and I'll give you a crash course. Hello and welcome to Learn BI Online with me, Adam Finer, bringing you business intelligence for beginners and beyond. If you're new here, welcome. You won't have noticed, but the name of the channel has changed. New name, new brand, and there's a new website to match. For you regular viewers, do let me know what you think of the new look in the comments below. So in the next 15 minutes or so, you'll learn the essentials you'll need to get started with Data Studio. And do stick around until the end because I'll be announcing a competition, giving you the chance to win some prizes and showcase your dashboard building skills. So Google Data Studio, like most BI tools, fulfills three main tasks. Firstly, to connect to or load data. Secondly, to analyze and visualize data in charts, graphs, tables, etc. And third, to share visualized data in interactive dashboards. We'll look at each of these three parts of the BI process separately when it comes to Data Studio. But first, a quick look at the interface to show you where everything is. The interface is really quite basic and easy to navigate. When you first open Data Studio, you'll see a list of all your recent reports here. And if you'd like to jump straight in and create a new report, you can do so with a blank canvas, or you can choose one of the pre-built templates. You also have tabs to view all your data sources and explorers. You can then filter by recent, shared, or owned. To create new reports, data sources, or explorers, you can do so using this big Create button here. And that's it, a simple and straightforward interface. Let's move on to connecting to data. Let's start by creating a new data source in Data Studio. To do this, I'll click on the Create button and select Data Source. Okay, so there are lots of different data types and sources that you can connect to using Data Studio. They're split into two sections, Google supplied data sources and third party ones, most of which you'll need to pay for if you'd like to use them. There are currently 476 third party data source connectors. They're often referred to as connectors because that's what they do. They open up a connection to the data source that Data Studio can then use to query the data. You may notice that the same icons appear on lots of different connectors. That's because they're supplied by what are called data hubs, whereby if you sign up to them, you can access all of their different connectors. I've got links in the description to a couple of these if you'd like to check them out. And you also have this file upload connector that allows you to upload CSV files that are then stored in Data Studio's cloud storage. Other than that, most data sources are queried where they are and not stored anywhere within Data Studio's infrastructure. Let's start off by creating a data source from a CSV file I've got on my computer. I first select the file upload connector, which will ask me to locate the file. Once I do, it will start processing and uploading. Once that's done and it's showing as green, we hit connect. If it's not green, then there's a problem with how your data is formatted, but that's beyond the scope of this video. On the next screen, you'll be presented with what's called the data source schema. Basically, the fields or columns it contains. Data Studio will assign a data type to each field based on the data it contains. Text, number, date, etc. If there's anything that hasn't been correctly recognized, you can just change it in the schema. You can also, at this point, add new calculated fields and parameters. But I normally do this in the report builder, which we'll get onto shortly. CSV files are what are called unmapped data sources because their contents are unknown in advance, as opposed to mapped data sources that always contain the same fields. With those, there's no real need to check the schema. You can just jump straight through to either creating a report or exploring the data. So the process for connecting to different data sources is mainly the same. Just select the connector and follow the simple steps. Okay, now let's move on to the next part of the process. So in Data Studio, there are two ways you can use the calculation engine to analyze and visualize your data. 
Firstly, you have the explore functionality that's meant to help you explore your data. And the other is the report builder. Now, in terms of analysis, they work in almost identical ways with almost identical functionalities. This is why I almost never use the explore part of Data Studio. Some might say it's not best practice, and sometimes I feel I should use it more for data discovery. But while you're just getting started with Data Studio, I'd recommend going straight to the report builder. When you create a new report, you're always asked to select a data source to add even if you're doing so from the source you've just created, which is strange. But anyway, add the data source and we end up in the report builder with a table added by Data Studio to get you started. I'm just going to delete that. When nothing is selected in the report, you can see the data panel that lets you switch between different data sources in your account to see the available fields and create new queries. To start building our report, we can add a new chart from this button here or the insert menu. I'm going to start with a simple scorecard visualization. When I do this on the right, we have this panel where we can configure our scorecard. Different visualizations have different components and therefore different configuration options. But what's great is that only the options relevant to the visualization type you're working on are displayed, so you can't mess it up by doing something you shouldn't. A scorecard has just one metric in it that you can change here by either clicking on it, or dragging from the list to the metric, or to the scorecard itself, like so. Below our metric is where we can apply a date filter, so we can look at a specific time period. For CSV data like this, by default, the auto date period is set to all time, but with other data sources, it can be different, like with Google Analytics that by default applies the last 28 days as the time period to each query. The date field used is specified here and can be modified. Select custom and either manually select the start and end dates or choose from one of the predefined options. There are also advanced options, but I'll let you discover those. With certain visualization types, like the scorecard, you can also add a comparison date period, which will then display the percentage of difference between the two periods. One thing you need to be careful about when adding custom date ranges is that they're fixed. Any date filter you add to the report won't override the period set in the chart itself. That needs to be set to auto. Below the date range options, you can apply data filters to your query that you can create from any of the fields in your data set. So for example, if I wanted to see this scorecard filtered on the technology category, I would choose to include from the category field only values that are equal to technology. When I apply, we'll see the scorecard update and the filter we created will be saved and available for use with any other query going forward. To remove it, just hit the cross. With all visualization types, as well as having the data tab on the right to configure the makeup of the query, you also have the style tab that lets you configure the look and feel of it. Again, these style options will only be relevant to the visualization type you're working with, so you can't really make any mistakes. With scorecards, you can add conditional formatting that's dependent on the value displayed. You can alter how the primary value and comparison metric are displayed, how the labels appear in terms of font and positioning, and then you have border and background options. One great feature to help make building reports faster is the ability to copy and paste widgets, i.e. any elements on the report. So with this scorecard selected, I can just use the edit menu or my keyboard shortcuts to copy, paste, and then reposition the copied widget. From the data tab, I can just change the primary metric. Simple. Let's do that again to give us three scorecards, like so. Now, let's add a different chart type to the report, one with a few more components to configure. I'm going to choose a column chart and place it under our scorecards. You'll now notice in the data panel that we have an area for selecting dimensions that we'll use to break down our metric. 
Just going to jump in here quickly to say that if you'd like to dive a lot deeper into Data Studio and become fully proficient, there's a link in the description to my online course, which contains a full five hours of on-demand video in over 80 video lessons. Okay, back to the video. I'll add region. And we can also add a second dimension that will be used to break down our primary dimension even further, segment. When you have multiple values in a chart like this, you'll also see sorting options appear to sort based either on metric or dimension values, ascending or descending. When you have a breakdown dimension, you also have a secondary sort option. Finally, in the data tab, we have the chart interaction options. Firstly, you can activate cross filtering that allows you to click on elements within a chart and apply them as filters to other visualizations. Then you have change sorting that lets you do just that on the widget itself. Let's look at one further example and add a time series chart to the report. You may think this looks like a line chart, and you'd be right, but in Data Studio you have both a line chart option and the time series. With time series you can only add a date as the dimension, although you can use a non-temporal dimension as a breakdown. As you can see, the options in the data tab are similar to the ones available in the column chart. This will be the case for a lot of the visualization types. OK, I'm going to go ahead and add a few more charts to the report, and I'll see you back here in a second. So before moving on to the final step of the process, adding report interactivity and publishing, I'm very quickly going to show you how you go about adding new calculated fields to your data source. Quickly, mainly because it's more advanced, so beyond the scope of this introduction. However, here's a quick example. I'll hit Add a field and call my new field East Sales. The idea is that you use fields in your data set combined with different functions to write formulas to manipulate the data. For our formula, we'll use the if function and simply write if region equals East, comma, sales, comma, zero. This essentially checks every row in the region column, and if the value is east, then it will pick up the value in the sales column. Otherwise, it will just give a value of zero. When we save, our new field will be available in our field list to use whenever we want. To show how it works, I'll drop the new field onto this chart here, and we'll see that only the east region data is displayed. So here we are in the report with all of my visualizations added, and we're ready to start thinking about adding some interactivity options that will let our viewers ask questions of the data in real time. We already have the ability to apply chart elements as filters for each chart, and then we have what Data Studio calls controls. You can add them from the insert menu or from this button here. There are eight options, with the first four related to classic data filters and displaying them in different ways, either as a drop-down list, a fixed size list, or as an input box to type in the values you're searching for, or as an advanced filter. You can use dimensions or metrics with these controls, but you'll mostly be using them with dimensions, except maybe with the advanced filters. Then we have sliders and tick boxes. Sliders are used with metrics and allow the viewer to set a range of values to display in the report. Tick boxes are used with Boolean values, true or false, meaning they've only got two available states to select, ticked or not ticked. To my report, I'll add a fixed size list using the category dimension and a slider using my sales metric. The next control is a date range control, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It allows viewers to apply date ranges to the report to view specific periods. The options are similar to those we saw when setting date periods in charts. Finally, the data control works only with specific data sources like Google Analytics, whereby you can switch between different data properties, not relevant for this data source. 
And that's it. We've built our report with visualizations and interactivity controls. The next step is to publish to those who need to view the report. This is done in typical Google style via this share button. You can add people and manage the access they have to the report. You also have control over the version of the report the viewer sees. In the file menu, you have the publishing settings. In fact, it's only setting singular for the time being. When I activate manual report publishing, I have control over when I publish new versions. I can keep one version live while making changes in the background before publishing a new version here. We've only really just touched the surface of all of the functionalities available for transforming your data into interactive reports, but it gives you a great starting point for diving further into it. There's a link in the description to my five hour online course if you want to check it out. Right then, competition time. If you'd like the chance to win a $25 Amazon gift voucher or a runner up prize of free access to my full Data Studio course, all you need to do is to build a report in Data Studio using a dataset I've made available and share it with me. It's that simple. And then I'll organize a live stream during which we'll look at the submissions together and vote for the best ones. If it's a success, I'll even consider making it a monthly event. So don't worry if you're watching this long after the video was published, the competition may still be active. Okay, so here's exactly what you need to do. Firstly, in the video description, you'll find a link to get your hands on the dataset. Then once you've built your report, you'll need to join the Learn BI Online Facebook group, link also in the description, and share both a screenshot of and a link to the report. Remember to make the report publicly available via the share options so anyone can find and view it. In the Facebook group, you'll also find details about the closing date for submissions, as well as when the live stream will take place for the vote. Only one submission per person, but you can submit to different competitions as long as you haven't already won a prize in a previous one. Make sense? If you'd like some tips on dashboard design, I'd recommend checking out this video here. Good luck if you're going to take part and thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe and I look forward to seeing you in another video soon. Until then, stay BI curious. Yep, still saying that.